Hector uh, to welcome. I have a few more people sitting. Here we go. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to welcome everybody. And everybody actually includes about 80 people who are beaming in from I don't know, Mozambique, all around the country and maybe beyond uh, as a virtual program as well, which is, which is great. Uh, but this is, uh, anyway, a great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, in a moment uh, uh, David Godin and celebrate, among other things, Godin at 50, a retrospective of five decades in the life of an independent publisher. And I have to say, reading through this is really one of the best books I've ever read about a publisher going through what he has and, and the whole team is published because the accounts in here are very candid and straightforward and wonderful. So um, we'll come to that in a moment. Um, uh, just to start, um, as we do with all of our uh, talks, uh, to recognize the long past of the, of the land here, we are coming to you uh, from the ancestral lands of the Nipmuc tribal community uh, who remain an active presence here in central Massachusetts. Um, I'm Jock Heron. I have the pleasure and honor of being the chair of the council and uh, also a co-founder with Ingrid Jepson Mock, who some of you know of uh, Tidepool Press. So I, anyone that can do this for 50 years, I admire tremendously. <laughs> and for, uh, for us, um, actually for me going way back, both the Godine Press and also the Barry Press that Aldi Johnson had uh, founded were ones that were kind of the to me, the essence of what a fascinating kind of smaller press can be because so much focus was on content and editing, but also design production, the actual quality of the books themselves. And I said to somebody some time ago, not in David's presence or Sarah's, that if somebody gave me the opportunity to have any book from any publisher, and just as a blind draw, I said, Godine would be the one I'd choose because the range of things that are done and the quality of the, of the productions are always just so fast and you can't go, can't go wrong. Um, I think many of you know the mission of the AAS, just as a brief description, brief introduction as well, is to cultivate a much deeper understanding of American history and North American history and beyond. Uh, our focus is on primary evidence, and so we have, we collect virtually anything that's printed, as much as we can get pre-1877, without respect necessarily to the natural biases in terms of elite history or whatever. So we have ephemera, we have, but also, we're not a rare book library, we've got some extraordinarily rare books, and we have also um, a commitment to physical, the books themselves, as a, a fellow council member one time said, it's the Fort Knox, you have to have the primary document as well, but really for, since the 50s, uh, disseminating, so whether it's microfiche, microfilm, um, all the work that Ellen Dunlap did with digitization uh, and the like of making, we're about to get 90 million scans uh, for our non-exclusive use. So it's a combination to reach outside of what we do. And we've also been very committed to the history of the book. And uh, fortunately, Scott Casper couldn't be here. He's just back from uh, Morocco, but may have, con he was the, our new, uh, for two years now, our new president. Um, but he has uh, also got a bit of COVID, perhaps, so we'll figure that. But he had been very involved with the history of the book really back at the origin. And I see Daryl Heider. So many people here that sort of the commitment to actually the physical quality of the book does matter uh, quite a bit. So I think it's, uh, it's very appropriate that we celebrate David. And I also want to kind of include in the celebration and welcome is Sarah. Sarah Eisenman, who is a, uh, his wife, um, must be long-suffering, I don't know, but she's uh, it's a great pairing, and uh, but is actually a book designer of her own right, who is, I think, art director at uh, Knopf, but has also uh, done a number of books for Godin, and is also um, uh, teaches um, of, of book arts and the like. So it's great to have you here uh, as well. Um, so anyway, we, <coughs> oh, this is the pitch. Uh, we thank everyone for being here. <laughs> we're a nonprofit, so if anybody has extra nickels and dimes, we're always welcome. That includes the people in Mozambique um, uh, from afar, but it's, uh, we are a nonprofit, and it's, uh, any support we get is, is important for us. And uh, as far as our uh, visitors on YouTube, which is great to have you here, um, we uh, want to make sure that uh, there will be time for questions, and uh, Amanda Kondik is going to keep an eye on them when we sit so we can make sure that any questions you have can be can be shared uh, shared with us as well. Um, 
So anyway, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, 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 David. And I have a, another life teaching in the design engineering program at Harvard, and I've had the um, pleasure of bringing two classes to visit um, this extraordinary place in Milton, or you call it the Hilton, Milton, whatever it is, but it's a sense of extraordinary collection of books where students get it, who are digital natives, or whatever their phrase is, have this extraordinary opportunity to actually handle books from the 15th century on to the 21st century. And, um, and he puts them through the paces, inferences that people have to look at. Each person did a different century as we go through. And then to go out and print um, in that great uh, printing uh, uh, barn that you have. Uh, and so it's a great experience to see the 3D aspect of, of <coughs> uh, this is a different type of 3D printing, I think. But you can see the texture of what letterpress is, is all about. So. Um, I've seen him in action, and that's great fun to see. So David uh, was born in, um, in Cambridge, went to Roxbury Latin, educated uh, also at Dartmouth College, who I think was sort of a transformational experience with Ray Nash in his book arts program. Ray Nash was an a, a active member of the American Antiquarian Society uh, going way back. And I think, uh, David, you also learned a little bit about copyright law, when lyric verses, is that correct? We, I don't know if that will come up later. I have a question for you. No, just kidding. Um, anyway, <laughs> that was the thesis. And then went down to um, uh, Northampton, which has been certainly a center of, of book arts uh, for, for a long time. And uh, was apprenticed really with Harold McGrath, who was the great real printer behind the scenes of a lot of uh, good houses, <coughs> including the Gehenna Press. And it's hard to imagine better training than that. And then with uh, Lance Heidi and Martha Rockwell. And Lance Heidi did the poster of the uh, American Antiquarian Society for the 175th anniversary, um, interestingly enough, uh, and sort of got moved to Boston and got the ball rolling in terms of what has become the uh, Godine Press. And he has attracted lots of talent right at the beginning, uh, Katie Homans, people who may also know Susie Marsh, who's from Holden, I think sort of started perhaps with uh, with uh, Godine Press, and so has attracted people. And I think Aldi Johnson did some of that as well, uh, Daryl, because I remember you worked with him. I know Carol Blinn, I think, may have worked with him, I think, and then Abigail Romer. So the ability to kind of bring people in, I think, is a really important part of this story. But another key thing to me is the, um, the range of publications done by Godine are quite remarkable, but you didn't get kind of trapped, not trapped in the, in the letter press looking back. It was sort of how can you bring the same kind of sensibility and style and new technologies into actually book design. And I think that's been one of the kind of real uh, testaments here. And I think the final book under your lead was, a, which I think is an amazing book, A Grammar of Typography, Classical Design, The Digital Age, which is picked as one of the top 100 books by Grolier on typography. So, so you've done a whole series of books on that. Um, and it's just, uh, it's great fun to have you here. And so welcome, David Godin. <laughs> These are hand printed. I, I, I don't dare show them for YouTube people, but this is just copies of these for everybody. Thank you. This is a terrible echo. Can you hear me okay? Um, it's very nice to be back here. The last time I was here, there was a lecture on Audubon, who I learned had gone to my alma mater, Dartmouth, where Daniel Webster had bought the sets and I always wondered why they only had two sets of the birds, and the reason was that Webster never paid for them. So <laughs> they kept the two sets, and the, two, the other two, the last set was never paid for. Um, a, a brief history of me, because this is really about the books, and I think the Godin at 50 is really about the books. I've deliberately tried not to make this a personal history of David Godin, but really a history of the books we worked on and the people who were the most important um, aspects of them we worked with. Uh, but I grew up in Boston. Well, actually, I grew up in Marblehead and then Brookline. And history was always, you know, a part of the culture. Um, across the river was Oscar Hanlon Beer and Bird, Bud Balin, we read those people in high school. Um, we had five years of compulsory Latin and three years of compulsory Greek. It was an old-fashioned school, really, I think, dying at that point. I'll get into this later. Um, the admission process consisted of you'd be walking down 
the stairs to wrestling practice, and Fred Reed, the headmaster, would from the top of the stairs say, go Dean, so where do you want to go to college? And you'd say Dartmouth, and he'd said, well, I'll call him in the morning, I'll let you know. That was it, you know, you'd know within 24 hours whether you were in or not. Um, Dartmouth was an equally wonderful experience in a different way. Um, the problem with a school like Roxbury Latin is it prepares you so well for college that you can really fake your way through almost anything for at least three years. But I managed to discover a teacher there named Ray Nash who was giving a course on print and printmaking and books and bookmaking. And the really unusual thing about those, that course, I hate the word thing, it's the weakest, the best aspect of those courses were that Nash not only taught you the intellectual history of the book, but you also had to practice the processes involved so you really understood what an etching was or what an engraving was, or the difference between engraving on copper with a burin and the engraving on the end grain of a Turkish block boxwood. Um, none of us, I think, grew up to be artists except for maybe Stephen Harvard, but you never looked at a book printed, this, printed a printed book the same way as a result of that course. I mean, you knew from that, whether you could do it or not, what good printing was, what a great engraving looked like. And it was all, as I think Paul Sachs's course was at Harvard, it was all really show and tell. You really sat around a table, Nash would pass something around, you would have to look at it, you'd have to say when it was made, who made it, was it what the binding was, what the paper was, and then you had to say, which I find remarkable that we have to say this today, but if you talk to interns, you understand this, whether it was good or bad. Um, is it a good example of an etching? Is it an early example of an etching? Is it good printing? How is the paper? Is the binding appropriate to the book? Um, the biggest problem we had with any intern coming to Godine was basically the ability to say something was good or bad. Um, the tendency today is to sort of, the, the question is always if you're a publisher, basically do you publish the book or you don't? It's not can you make the book better, can you rework chapter five, you know, can Ellen who appears in chapter two be made more sexy by chapter five? It's really a question of, is this something you want to proceed with? And that's something we re I really learned at D Dartmouth and Roxbury Latin, the ability to say, yes, I want to go ahead with something, yes, it's good, or no, it's bad, I don't want to do it. It doesn't mean you were right. It doesn't mean you were right at all, but the ability to make that decision, I think, is crucial to being a publisher. You'll see lots of mistakes, but... <laughs> For better or worse, I thought these were good books. Um, I'm going to concentrate primarily on history because that's what this organization is about. That's what I love. Um, that's what the quote by Bernan Balin, which you can pick up in, when you go, is about. Um, the motto of Roxbury Latin School, somewhat morbid, was mortui vivos docent, the dead teach the living. You sort of, you learn to live by that motto over time. Let's move on. <laughs> well, <laughs> it had its moments, I'll say that. This is where we began. This was an abandoned cow barn in Brookline. Um, let me go back to that. You can see that we are just installing the windows. You see the labels? <laughs> they were... They were new, the furnace was new, the cesspool was new, the toilets were new. The cows had left two years before and it was exactly as it had left. So we had to really do all the work in this. And you have to remember that we were in our 20s. We were in our early 20s. We were 22, 23 years old. We knew nothing about business. We knew something about printing. We knew absolutely nothing about publishing. And we certainly didn't know anything about bookkeeping. Uh, I remember my father, three years into this enterprise, saying, well, 
have you filed any tax returns? Tax returns, never heard. What, are you kidding? He said, well, I'm going to send over Lester Kahn, my accountant, this time you really filed with the government. Are you a corporation? <laughs> never heard of it. So Lester came over and he said, I'd like to see your books. And of course, I was thrilled by this. <laughs> and I started in the 16th century and I got as far as, I think, Baskerville, when Lester interrupted and said, those aren't exactly the books I had in mind. <laughs> sort of went on from there. <laughs> got worse from there. <laughs> this is, whoop, let me go back. That, no, I'm going to go back. That's Peggy. I, I printed these broadsides in the same press, by the way. And there were, I think, probably four or five of us at this point. We were all, this was our socialist phase, so we were all making $65 a week. And Lance would occasionally come in with a food fad. I remember there were two months of nothing but rice and beans when we went through the Gandhi phase. But we really worked together all day long and sometimes well into the night. This was, of course, all letterpress, little pieces of metal, um, set for the most part in terms of the books in, by Mackenzie and Harris in San Francisco. I mean, this really sounds insane today. Packed in wooden boxes, shipped to us, where we would break down long galleys into pages. There would always be an extra font of type so we could make corrections, because this was monotype. And then when we were done, we'd basically send it back to San Francisco to be melted down and made into another book. We had this, we had a Heidelberg, and we had a Kelly 3, which is a big press that Harold really worked on and was capable of double rolling. And this is what the outside looked like. That's Lance's VW bus. And we, we had the back part of that. The front part belonged to Jimmy Lawrence, who every Sunday night would show up in black tie to ride. He rode every night. I can't remember the name of his horse, but I remember the name of the pony, which always got out. Um, and it was great fun. We did great work in those four years that we were there. The rent was a book a year. This was the first book we did, um, Offset. Uh, I want to talk a little about this. Um, offset, you know, is basically a lithographic process. We had been letterpress printers. This is Whitman's diary. I had written Alfred Kazin to say, what book do you think should be reprinted from the American canon? And he said, without question, Whitman's Specimen Days. Whitman was the only author of any repute who actually served in the Civil War. Twain did for two months. Everybody else would pay somebody to serve from them. They would write about whatever their cause was, Emerson, Longfellow, Thoreau. But very few people actually went down and fought in the war. Uh, Whitman didn't fight in the war, but he served in the hospital there when her, his brother was badly wounded at, at um, Bull Run. And he was there for four years treating both soldiers from the North and soldiers from the South. Washington, D.C. was under siege for most of the war. Never invaded, but the, the rebel army was close enough so you could see them. It was a dangerous position. It was certainly heartbreaking work. There were, of course, no anesthetics. Um, this is the Parade of the Union down Pennsylvania Avenue. You can see the dome right in the distance that Lincoln insisted on finishing during the war because he saw it as a symbol of the Union. And we printed this, this was a poster we did with calligraphy by Bram de Deuce, but I wanted to show it because this is Aiken's photograph of Whitman three months before he died. They became close friends, and actually Aiken's drove to Camden where Whitman was living to take these great series of photographs. And at the back of the book, we really have a portfolio of 61 really f portraits of Whitman from the youngest one that we know in being the youngest to these last ones by Whitman. But the problem in this book was, there actually you see the young, young Whitman. How do you, the, reproduc the reproductions of photographs, Lance's idea, and Ken Burns gives him credit for this, was to take photographs and use them to illustrate a nonfiction text. This was 
somewhat new at the time. Nobody was doing this. And not only to reproduce these photographs, but to really reproduce them well, so they were as close to the full-tone originals as possible. You can only do this with fine-line duotone. And fine-line duotone, which means 300 little dots to an inch, was really developed down in Meriden, Connecticut by Harold Hugo and Richard Benson, probably in the early 50s, because up till then they had been a collotype plant. It's called Meriden Gravure, but they never had any gravure machines. It was all collotype. Collotype was a great process, but you could never repeat the same thing twice. So they needed to have a process whereby documents such as the ones that the American Antiquarian Society, or the Mass Historical Society, and photographs could be reproduced from the originals as accurately as possible. And the way to do that is to shoot something in 300 lines straight down, and then to shoot it at an angle of 30 degrees this way to bring out the highlights, and then to print in two colors, usually an off a loft gray or a slightly brown and a black. And that's how we did this book. And our idea from the beginning was to do it letterpress and then to strike in the duotones. And I remember Howell bringing in my, his office down at Meriden. This was in 1971. And explaining to me that if we were going to do 6,000 copies, which was my crazy idea, that we would probably go bankrupt within a month or two. And he was absolutely right about this. So we did the whole book offset, and we had a special paper made for it. And it came out beautifully, and thank God it was reviewed by Leo Marx in page three of the New York Times, so we would not be standing here today talking to you. We, we would have gone out of it. It was a, a terribly stupid gamble. You know, one year into our life, we were almost dead, and it had not been for that Leo Marx review, I'm sure we would have been dead, because there we were with 6,000 copies. And I remember after that review hit, we had never shipped more than three copies of a book, any one title, in our two years of life. And suddenly Richard Abel was calling from Portland, Oregon, ordering 500 copies. <laughs> we had no idea how to ship 500 copies. We can't put them in individual boxes, you know, the idea of putting them in a crate. Anyway, we'll move on from here. That's, that's the object lesson for this. Op Offset was introduced as early as 1971. Okay, let's see if I can make this go forward. This was the next year, and it, it's a return to letterpress. And these were wood engravings by Michael McCurdy, a wonderful wood engraver um, who we knew. He lived in Concord at that time. And I'm sure most of you in the room know this, but a wood engraving is done on the end grain. I'm going to pass this around. And usually it's done in Turkish boxwood, and it's very smooth on one side. And you engrave it as you would copper with a burin, like this, holding it in your hand or putting it in a pad, moving the block around. It, it, it allows you, as you'll see in this block, really to engrave very, very fine lines. It's very different from a woodcut, which is cut on the plank with a knife. So the, the, the whole beauty of the wood engraving it, or the wood cut, is that it's cut type high. You can print it along with type. You don't have to print it separately from the type, as you would an engraving or you would a lithograph, for instance. So this was done, as you can see, because we were, we had a lot of time. At, we had no money, but we had a lot of time. So we could do title pages like this in three colors, the gray, the maroon, and the black. Um, and you could integrate wood engravings with texts like this, set in that blandest of all typefaces, Baskerville. You can never go wrong with Baskerville. It's a story of, some of this I'm gonna have to read because I don't remember it all, but I wrote this. Sarah Kimball Knight, our heroine, a plucky entrepreneur, who Malcolm Freiburg refers to as that plump, keen-eyed, and sharp-tongued observer of colonial New England, was born in Boston in 1666 and made this journey on horseback in the dead of winter in October of 1704 at the age of 39. She set out for this journey uh, to New Haven, and she went on following roughly the same route that the Amtrak train follows today all the way to New York. 
She recorded this in her diary, revealing herself as a talent, even extraordinary writer, keenly observant, possessing a sharp eye for local color and a sheer, sheer, sure ear, boy, that's a tough one to say, a sure ear for dialogue, quite without pretense or guile. First published in 1825, it went through a number of editions, including one designed by Bruce Rogers, and is here present set in Baskerville, as I mentioned, the blandest of all typefaces, with the wood engravings by Michael McCurdy. Um, we were doing, at this point, maybe 1,000, 1,500 copies of the book. Um, I think what's interesting is this was right at the time when Sputnik went up. And <laughs> you don't, well, I remember how terrified America was by Sputnik. I mean, this was Armageddon. It was really a signal the Soviets were soon going to be able to bomb Boston. And tons of money were, was given to libraries. I don't know for what reason, but libraries were rolling in money. And you could publish anything between 1971 and 1975. And with even the, the smallest review anywhere, even a bad review anywhere, you'd be assured of selling five to 600 copies. Not true today, but it was really true in the early 70s. And the libraries, of course, had nothing else to spend their monies on. I mean, there were no CDs. There were a few magazines. There were no DVDs. There weren't, you know, no one was streaming TV programs. So all the money really went to books. Probably 40% of our sales went to libraries. By the time I retired, maybe 10% of our sales went to libraries. And we never got any mail from librarians in the, 20th, in the 21st century. In the 1970s and 1980s, we'd get a letter from a librarian almost every week. Not always praise either, saying, what were you thinking pricing it at this? Or did you know that you omitted the date in the title page? Or there's no ISBN on the copyright page? I mean, they were, they were really into the books. And I miss that more than probably anything else in the last first two decades of this millennium. This, you may recognize, this is Walter Muir Whitehill's book on Boston. Um, this was actually my idea because I knew that Walter had inherited the progressives of these 29 engravings that Daniel Berkeley Updike would send out to his customers at Christmas time, starting in 1911 and ending with his death in 1941. Um, Ruzika, these two people, Updike and Ruzika, could not have been more dif different. Uh, Ruzika was born in Bohemia. He came to this country um, at age 11. He spoke no English. He went to school, and they put him in the first grade. Um, he was a talented artist even then and beloved by his teachers because he could draw on the blackboard. Uh, went to trade school, learned to engrave, went to Washington, never went to college. Neither did Updike, for that matter. Um, came to New York, and everyone said, well, you have to meet Mr. Updike, who he initially found insufferable, which Updike was. Um, Updike was a staunch Anglo-Catholic from Rhode Island, socially extremely conscious. Ruzika was, of course, on the other side of the tracks, as far as he was concerned. But they became close friends, and Updike, if nothing else, had a real a real eye for talent. I mean, he also employed Dwiggins during this period and saw in Ruzika somebody who really could make colored wood engravings, and this would mean that every color there had to be printed from a separate block in a separate color and then registered perfectly. So a block like this, which shows the bullfinch dome from the garden of El Ellery Sedgwick, who was the editor of The Atlantic, really a powerful literary position at that time, looking down at Bullfinch's Dome, which is, for the record, not originally gold. It was originally actually brick and then covered with whitewash, and it wasn't until Paul Revere covered it with copper, and then they painted it gold, that it really turned into this, the gold icon that it is today. But let's just look at a few of these. Each one of these has a Latin inscription, which I would urge you to look at because that too was cut in wood 
And anyone who's tried to make a, an engraving with that level of detail in the lettering knows what Ruzika was going through or had to face. There's that. This is the Adams Homestead and what was then Braintree, which is now Quincy. And I'm sure you know what that quote means. From Ecclesiasticus, let us now praise famous men. Here's the original Quincy Homestead, which is right next door to it. And that means stop a while visitor. There's a portrait of Updike who I'm sure dressed like this even when he went to bed. <laughs> and there's Bruce Rogers, who is another force, obviously, in Boston at this time, who was working at Riverside between roughly 1898 and 1914. The Riverside editions, all designed by Rogers, who really oversaw his own shop on the other side of the river at the press in Cambridge. On to... <laughs> This is one of my favorite books. Um, Noel Perrin was a really great friend of the press. We did first person rural, second person rural, third person rural. Um, we did what his, I think his great book was about the Japanese reversion to the sword um, from the guns, which had been introduced to Japan very early on. They had guns right through. 15, 15, 15, 16, but the samurai class realized that if you could kill somebody from, you know, a distance of 30 yards, it wasn't the same as really cutting off their heads with a sword. So the guns were outlawed, and they really weren't reintroduced to Japan until Perry opened it in 1851, but that's off the subject. So Noel, Noel found the single copy of this, which existed in London, and it's a story probably told by an English sailor, probably a purser who served in the Revolution. Um, it's called Loyal American Refugee. It's a real anomaly. Um, Perrin begins his introduction with a sentence. For, I love this. Forgotten books are usually forgotten because they deserve to be. <laughs> but goes on to argue, a few, a very few books are reprinted because they still make good reading. Jonathan Cordenkob is one of that small number. It was a lively book when it was first published in 1787 and makes, if anything, even livelier reading now. This proves to be the case because Corncob, in the first chapter, actually impregnates the farm girl next door who has a great name, I think, of Desire Slawbuck. And he has a choice of either marrying Desire or paying 50 pounds, but he decides that it would be better to leave Boston or leave the farm in a moose and go to Boston. So here you see him riding the moose with Desire behind him. He joins a, the British, a British privateer. He goes to New York. He makes raids on New Jersey. Um, he's really a rake. I mean, the only, the only worst people in the book really are the British, um, who were both lazy, slothful, and, and thoroughly unlikable, whereas Corncob at least has sort of a comic el element to him. But the great thing about the book, I think, is the illustrations by Mark Livingston. And I brought an original back there that you can look at. Mark was a Williams graduate. He was in his 20s. He was always already working for Knopf and Grossman Publishing. And the quality of his line this is where you really get in trouble with great illustrators like him, because when you reduce a drawing that size, probably this big, to a page about this size, the lines come together, and you cannot see the fineness, the finesse, or the humor with which, which, with which they were invested by Mark. Um, he moved to California. I don't think he illustrated very many books after that, but... In terms of real geniuses, Mark Livingston was one of the first we encountered and was there right from the beginning. There's um, another picture, Bottle Glory. This we did in 1975. Um, up till then, I think we had just published sort of either dead white males or living white males in their 60s and 70s. 
So when Steve Dunwell came to us with this project, he was in his 20s like us. He had been trained as a photographer, and he had spent five years really documenting the decline of the mill industry in New England, which by that time had just about died. He had gone to all the towns where mills one ex once existed. I wrote down the names of some of these towns because I'd never even heard of them. But when you look at the pictures of them in this, the, the book, these were major industrial centers. I mean, they employed hundreds, if not thousands, of people. Um, I think it, it was a disaster that, well, he points out the disaster in this. Um, you've all heard of the Amoskeag Mills in Manchester, but have you ever heard of Forestdale in Manville in Rhode Island, or Danielson in Rockville, Sawyerville in Manville in Connecticut? Mechanicsville? I mean, when you look at the pictures in his book, which I'll show you in a minute, you realize these weren't small enterprises. These were enterprises. There's one. This is a small town in Connecticut. The mill occupies the entire right-hand side of the river. This is what, can you read what that says? It was an eye-opener for me. I, you know, if you drive up, I think it's Route 93 or 91, 93 through Manchester, you see the huge mills there, which are now all occupied. But I had no idea that if you had running water, if you could build a mill pond anywhere, you had a mill, and vast fortunes were made. The book, this was a transitional book because we were still setting hot metal. As specimen days, as here, the type was actually from metal. This was just as we were getting into phototype, well before computer type. And the pages were really laid out by Bob Dothard, you know, with the scissors and paste. You would, probably some of you remember this, but you'd basically take, cut out the pictures, you would paste them where they were to go, and then the lithographer, the printer, would take a picture of the page, and they were printed this way. And these pages were complex, and there was a ton of information that had to be shown. This is the great Amoskeag Mill in Manchester. The end of the book, there's a, this amazingly touching, um, probably 20 or 30 pages of interviews with and photographs of the mill workers who had been totally abandoned um, by their owners. There's a graph in the book which I was hoping we would show. This is really a, the pathetic last picture in the book, 1974. This is the Crown and Eagle Mills in North Up, I think it was in Uxbridge, yes, it was North Uxbridge, Massachusetts, which burned, burned to the ground. And it's a fitting, really, epitaph to a, an industry that which in five or six years completely collapsed in New England and moved south. And the owners refused to do anything about it. This is, I, my takeaway from the book was none of this had to happen. These were all third and fourth generation owners. They lived far from the mills. They had no investment um, in the people or in the buildings. And they had a choice of whether to reinvest, buy new equi equipment, update the mills, um, provide some benefits for the workers. It wasn't salaries. It wasn't the fact that salaries were cheaper in the South. It was the fact that the South was really buying new equipment and was investing in this equipment and New England had already made its fortunes, vast fortunes in the 19th century. And by the 20th century, the owners were really willing to walk away from it. Oh, I just, let me just read you. I don't like reading, but this is worth reading. This is his, this is the first sentence of the foreword of the book. The spinning and weaving of natural fibers are among the most ancient and vital of arts. For millennia, craftsmen have brought warp and weft together to clothe and decorate people of every description. 
and to make utilian objects of every kind. He goes on then to let, list the number of things that we take for granted, from sneakers to sails to T-shirts that are all made from cloth. Then it says, they are all textile products, and they are all made by working people who live workaday lives and toil without a thought of recognition or glory. Industrialization replaced the craftsman with the machine, but, is, but it is a rare machine so automatic that it doesn't need to be programmed, tended, or watched by someone. We should have reprinted this book. And it, too, was saved by a... Um, that got a front-page review in the New York Times, and that really saved our bacon. This was Joe... Well, let me go back. This was Joe Blumenthal's book on the printed book in America. Um, this followed the 1973 exhibition at the Morgan Library, um, The Art of the Printed Book, which had been commissioned by Charles Rice Camp and really started with the Gutenberg Bible, of which they own two and a half copies, right through the Officina Bodoni. Um, and Ed Latham at Dartmouth said, well, why don't we do the same thing for the book in America? Well, the problem with a book in America is you don't start with the Gutenberg Bible. You start with Stephen Day, and the printing is really pretty wretched. So what Joe did, I think, wisely was concentrate in the most important printed books rather than the most beautiful printed books. So he has everything from the Eliot Bible and the Baysam book right through the fine printing of the 20th and 21st century. Um, you'll be pleased to know that six pages of the text are devoted to Isaiah Thomas. Whoop, I'm doing this wrong again. And there is a spread of two books no one else in this book, by the way, gets two pages. Isaiah Thomas is the only one who gets two. Um, smaller in format, again done in Baskerville with a plate section printed by Meriden Gravure Company. In print for many, many years. Now we're going to go, because I'm going to skip three centuries. <laughs> if I talked about three centuries, more, you'd be here all night. But I thought... Let's take some books from the last 10 or 10 years. Um, this was done in 2015, and it was Belinda Rathbone's account of her father at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, where he was a director from 1955 to, I think, 1976. And the scandal, I don't think that's too large a word, that surrounded his buying of a Raphael which was meant to compete with the Metropolitan's buying of Rembrandt's um, Aristotle contemplating the bust of Homer. Both museums had been founded the same year. They were both celebrating the centennials in the same year. Boston felt it was compelled to somehow compete with the Met. And they learned that there was this allegedly authentic Raphael available. Um, they smuggled it into this country, and that's exactly what they did do. They didn't declare it at customs, which was the big mistake. The Italian government got wind of this, and they put an investigator by the name of Rivieri in the case, who really was like a bulldog, and he followed the, the images of the photograph, of the picture, all the way from Italy, through customs, to the museum, and made the allegation, one of the earliest, that this was stolen art. Well, it wasn't stolen in the sense that it hadn't been paid for, it had been paid for. It was stolen in the sense that Rathbone and his chief curator had failed to declare it at customs, which would have really completely dissolved the argument of the, of the Italian government. So that's sort of the basic story. But the understory to me was much more interesting. It's really the story of Boston's institutions in the 50s and the 60s, who, which were facing terrific issues. The most telling fact in this book, which I'll always remember, in 1955, when he came to the MFA, there were 1,000 members of the MFA, and they were paying $5 a year in for, to be a member. There was 
No Jews, there were no blacks, there were no Catholics. The protocol was at the end of the year, Mr. Cabot and Mr. Honeywell would sit around a big table and the director would say, well, the deficit for this year, gentlemen, is $112,000. And they would all whip out their checkbooks and write out checks for it. And that was the end. And it was sort of a private boys club. And it probably happened at the Athenaeum. It probably happened at every institution. In the 50s, and certainly by the 60s, there was a real cry that the museum should be more open, um, that it should be more, to use the current word, inclusive, um, that it should reach out to the community in which it was located, that the school which it ran should admit more people of color. Um, and they were all legitimate ar arguments, and they were led by the chief of the board of trustees. And he, who came from a background really in economics, he ran a packaging, a, meat, a ham packaging plant, and clearly Rathbone were at loggerheads the whole time. And it really ended with Rathbone being dismissed uh, from the museum. But I'm sure that the museum was not alone in the struggle. Uh, I'm sure every institution had to make this transition from what was essentially a private club where a few rich patrons would sit around and make up the deficit to one that was really a public institution in some way. And although this gentleman, whose name I'll remember in a minute, um, gets a black eye in the book, he really had a point. I mean, this was a public museum, presumably open to the public. It wasn't a private club. Um, at that point, it was not charging any admission. There were no corporate memberships. There were no corporate members. It was unheard of that, you know, a local bank like Shawmut would contribute to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. It didn't happen. He saw the organization was antique, archaic. He also resented the fact that Rathbone was not, not only the director of the museum, but he was also the head of American art. He was the one buying the most expensive art and making the most expensive decisions there at the museum. It had ended in a bloodbath. I mean, many of, the, many of the trustees retired. The museum was totally reorganized and went on from there. And it's all in this book. And it's really, I think, although she is dispassionate, she tries to keep her distance. It's a sympathetic portrait of a man who was just born in a different generation and really was not trained by Paul Sachs at Harvard that these were the kinds of problems you were in going to encounter when you walk into a place like the Museum of Fine Arts. This is, this is the Boston Raphael. She now resides in the basement of the View Feezy Gallery, totally discredited, and nobody sees her anymore. And there is Rathbone talking to Tom Hoving of the Met on their anniversary in Boston. This was a poster we did with Lance Heidi to celebrate our 80th birthday. And since we have this in common with the AAS, I just thought I'd show it. Um, Starling Burgess is probably a name not known to many of you here. Um, he attended Milton Academy with Louis Howland. They both had deep backgrounds in yacht building, in racing, sailboat racing. Louis, I think, from the time he was a student there, was just determined someday to write the great biography of Starling Burgess. A worthwhile ambition in every way. Starling Burgess, even at age 16, had a patent granted him at Milton Academy for inventing the, a machine gun. Um, and went on from there, as you'll see. Uh, this picture shows the first of the great J-boats, close hauled to windward. This is Endeavor. He designed three. His father, Edward Burgess, designed three, all of which won the American Cup. Burgess designed three, all of which won the American Cup. He began life as a poet, didn't get far in that. This is his first published book. This is him later in life. 
This is one of his great designs, Maxman, followed by the 12-meter northern light on a port tack crossing Buzzards Bay. Three of the class boats he designed. This is Ranger, the last and greatest of the J-boats, 1937. He designed this with the man who would really completely change um, yacht design in, the, in that century, uh, Olin Stevens III, in Maine. She was built at the Bath Ironworks in Maine. 137 feet long, displacement of 160,000 pounds. This was a big boat. She never lost a race. She's the only boat that ever beat con conclusively Blue Nose in the Fisherman's Cup. And the captain refused to go on with the races because he knew that his schooner would, would, would lose. This is a wonderful photograph of Olin, who always looks like he just got out of high school, on the left. Rod, his brother, and that's Harold Vanderbilt, who funded all three of the great J-boats, Endeavor, Rainbow, and Ranger and Starling Burgess, who looks like he could really use a good tailor. Really sort of looks like Charlie Chaplin in this. <laughs> I mean, look at, the, even I don't dress that badly. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> this is after uh, Ranger just won, I think. No, this was on her launch on May 17th, before she thoroughly whipped um, Sir Thomas Lipton's Shamrock the Fourth, I think. Then he, he started really as a yacht designer, and then he had this amazing career as a, a naval, really a narrow, an airplane architect. He had the original Wright brothers patent to build airplanes, the first in this country. And this is a picture of his shed in Marblehead, which burned to the ground in 1919. I'll get to that. There's one of the first planes he flew this was actually in the North Shore. These were early planes. I mean, you can tell this just by looking at this. And what's interesting, it's not a pull plane, it's a push plane. The, the engine is in the back. It's actually pushing the plane. He designed the first seaplanes, the very first seaplanes to fly, and they were actually commissioned by the Navy. This was an early prototype flying over a lake in Hamilton, Massachusetts. He worked with Buckminster Fuller. This is the Dimaxion, um, which really, I think, he was probably as responsible for knowing Starling Burgess um, as Buckminster Fuller. Whoops, I'm gonna go back a minute. Uh, his life was a total shambles. I mean, he, had, he was a serial philanderer. He had five wives. He made love to everything on two legs and probably four. Um, he, he was an, really an impossible, I wouldn't say totally irresponsible human being, but you don't love him as a person. But as an inventor, as, as someone who couldn't touch anything without making it better or asking you know, why isn't it done this way? Why doesn't the periscope extend so you can pull it up from a submarine? Why isn't the conning tower aerodynamically shaped? He was designing boats with five sails in 1944, which we're looking at today as possible alternatives to boats that run on diesel. Um, the book is over there. It's, I don't know, 300, 400 pages. Sarah designed it. We printed it with no stops. Um, it's an amazing chronicle of a genuinely, I wouldn't say great human being, but certainly a great inventor, a great thinker, and someone who page after page say, I can't believe he did that. Well, Nim is here tonight, so I have to speak very fondly of this book, which I would do even if Nim weren't here tonight. Um, I knew Nim's work, actually, he was at Harvard, and he had sent me very early on, I think I still had it, have it, a study he had done of early American songbooks. 
And 40 or 50 years later, I came across this and I said, gee, Nim, whatever happened to this project? And Nim wrote back, well, I'm still working on it. Um, and he was and had been for 40 years. Um, this was a book, of, I think, amazing ambition. It's two volumes, you'll see them over there. It covers all of New England, it covers the early, really, in, I wouldn't say invention, but the propulsion from Boston and Massachusetts out to the New, York, New England states of choral music, religious, secular. It includes all of engravings from and references to all of the engraved songbooks that people used. There was hardly a community in New England that didn't somehow have a choir or a group of people who would get together and sing these songs, generally from songbooks that were produced in the thousands. And it's not only volume one, which deals with the North, but then Nim moves south and covers the shape note tradition, the traditions of the Appalachian Mountains. It, there'll never be another book like this. It was extremely difficult. There's one of the engravings from the book. I mean, think of, think of music. First of all, we had to, well, I should say, Nim and Susie Marsh had to take the original music and transfer it into a modern idiom that could be printed. So that was step number one. Secondly, you had to find a typeface that was such that it would fit under the notes. This shows just one verse, but many of these songs had five verses, and they weren't just printed below the bar, as it were. They were printed right under the notes. So every note had to fit the note to which it belonged. The paper, I couldn't have done this without Susie Marsh. Um, you know, she's enough of a musician, so she immediately got both the challenges and some of the solutions that were embedded in this project. But we really wanted to make it comprehensive. It has five indices. It's, it covers the field like no other book I think we've ever published. And as I wrote in my book, um, the lack of attention this book received in the press to me was so depressing um, that at that point I really thought, this is time to get out of this, this way of life. Um, this was a book that 20 years, 30 years ago would have been reviewed everywhere. I mean, the, the Boston Globe had a book review section back then. Remember that? The Detroit Free Press had one. Atlanta had one. LA Times had one. Chicago had one. They all had freestanding book sections. The New York Times was the only one left by the time this book was published. And there's no question in my mind, my mind that in 1970, had we done this book, it would have gotten reviewed. Um, this is no reflection on NIM. Uh, it's a great book in every way. It's a reflection on the times I think we published the book. And the place for books like this, the books I really love to do, had clearly passed. Lastly, you'll be pleased to know, um, this is the history of Roxbury Latin. I know this is, <laughs> this is a small field, but you know, occasionally you get a book like this from Jarvis, who was the headmaster there for 36 years, and you read it and you say, my God, you know, this is really interesting. I never knew this about Sam Adams. I never knew that he was this incessant, unrelenting firebrand who refused to accept that Boston didn't really want this revolution. This revolution was not something that was foreordained. There were many merchants in Boston who really believed in allegiance to George III, but what they hated were the taxes. They hated the taxes without representation. Had that issue been addressed by the British, the revolution might never have happened, but for people like Adams and, and others in Boston who just kept feeding the flame. Now, I'll grant that Jarvis was an unapolog unapologetic Anglophile. It was such that when you went into the school, there was a cutout of Queen Elizabeth II that greeted you at the door. 
and you would see, because Roxbury Latin was one of three schools with a royal charter, you would see the American flag flying under the flag of England. I mean, it was insane. So he has a take on this, on the issue of revolution that I had never read before, including the fact that the, the tea tax was really entirely reasonable. It was the India, the India Trading Company, the East India Trading Company, had a huge surplus of tea. What they were trying to do was dump cheap tea on Boston and the colonies. So Boston was already buying this tea, or if they had not dumped it in the harbor, would be buying the tea, at a huge discount of what they would normally be paying. The tax issue was a huge, is, is, and it was an excuse, basically, to stoke the fires. I won't go on about, about this is Sam, Samuel Warren, not Sam Adams. Warren was the other man who really, with Adams, stoked the flames, a graduate, of Roxbury Latin. Um, this is Eliot, who founded the school, the Apostle to the Indians. And he has 27 people, so I won't describe them all, but this is my favorite. This is Al Gordon, the chairman of Kidder Peabody. This chapter, you read it and you're, you just can't stop laughing. Here is a guy who was a staunch Republican, um, a staunch Anglican, and in many ways, a liberal to the core. I mean, someone who really funded the Harvard Business School, saved Roxbury Latin in any number of ways, who walked from every major airport to its attendant city, who here at age 91 is running in the London Marathon, who lived to 108 years old. He, he was an extraordinary human being. And the best story is, this is my last story, but it's so great. So the Indian Bible, of which I think there are maybe four copies left in private hands, written by the Apostle Eliot, uh, who was the founder of Roxbury Latin, comes up for sale at Christie's. And Tony decides, you know, how are we going to buy this book? Well, the only one who can afford it is Al Gordon. So he calls Al Gordon in his office at Peabody, at Kidder Peabody. Now, Al Gordon at this time was referred to in print as the titan of Wall Street. I mean, he really ran it. Um, and Gordon answers the phone. He says, Tony, you've got to be kidding. We have buildings that need repair. We have students who need scholarships. We need a school that needs an endowment. We need a refractory, whatever the hell that is, a refractory. Uh, there's no way we're going to invest in, in this stupid little book. And Tony, sort of being Tony, says, well, I understand your position, uh, Al, and, and, and let's just think about this. So the next day, he's teaching history, which he actually did, and the secretary runs into the room. And she said, uh, Mr. Jarvis, I have a call from Mr. Mr. Gordon uh, on the phone. And Tony had given instructions that he could only be interrupted if A, the school were in fire, B, if one of the boys were injured, or C, he got a call from Al Gordon. So he takes the call, and the call goes something like, Tony, do you know what's being offered for sale at Christie's next week? It's the Eliot Bible. I mean, it's the sacred text of Roxbury Latin. It was written by your founder. How can we not be, be and Tony's smart. He says, well, you know, Mr. Gordon, we, we have buildings that need repair, and we need, it goes through the whole thing. <laughs> and Gordon, Gordon, sure enough, you know, buys the book for $330,000 and now resides at the Houghton Library and Trust for the Roxbury Latin School. But it is a great story. Um, I will leave you with that and a picture of me with hair. Um, just in closing, you know, it, it's been a great career in this sense that every book you publish opens a whole new vista in something you never knew, you knew nothing about. My old math teacher used to say, Mr. Bridges, as the area of our knowledge increases, the circumference of our ignorance grows greater. And you really feel this as a publisher. You really feel, my God, you know, Martha's Vineyard duck decoys? Who in the world would publish a book about Martha's Vineyard? There are people out there, believe me, who are really interested in Martha's Vineyard duck decoys. And if you do the best book in the world on Martha's Vineyard duck decoys or Rails of the World or American Harmony, 
there will be 2,000 people out there who will probably buy this book. And that's, you know, I say it's the last refuge of the grasshopper mind. It's a place where you can go at night and you can read something like the story of Al Gordon. <laughs> and you just say, I had no idea. He walked from every airport, from <laughs> Tokyo airport to Tokyo? Who, would, who in the right mind would have done something like that? Um, it's a, a recurring revelation and I try to tell those stories in this book. As I say, it's really not about me. It's about me sort of getting educated about things that I found interesting and people I found interesting and artists I found interesting. And that's what made it a very fulfilling career. I'm glad I had it. And I'm glad you're here tonight. Thank you very much. I can get this working. We do have time for a few questions. Is that right? Is that okay, Dan? Just take this bit. And uh, anyway, thank you very much. And I think you reinforced what I was saying before that uh, the one publisher, you can have a blind draw and get any one of these books and be really happy with it, even the Roxbury Latin book. Uh, anyway, it's very, awesome very, very impressive. That was very good. So uh, we do have time for a, a couple of questions. I might just start with uh, uh, there's something about the book, this ancient, you know, half, cent, you know, half a millennium old technology that seems to be as enduring as ever. It's hard to do the business, but what is it about a book? You know, the Grolier Club just had the show, the early rocket, and then the Kindle and things. What is it about a book that really works for you and for the rest of us? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I worked at Book of the Month Club for two years in New York, and I can tell you, every five years, somebody would come up with a theory of why the book was going to die within the next five years. It happened when the bicycle was invented. It happened when radio came on. It came with TV. It came with the first computers. This was going to kill the book. It came with a Kindle. It's never happened. And the reason, I think, is obvious. And that's that, first of all, the book is the most conserv conservative of all the objects we handle. Think about it. I mean, Gutenberg could walk in today and he wouldn't understand the offset press. You know, he'd understand that. But he'd understand what Peggy Duhamel was doing on that Vandercook press. She was impressing paper on hot metal. And this was only in 1971, so it's a technology that really lasted for a long time. But when you think about it, you know, when you, when you read a book, somehow you have some residual memory of how you can find things going back on it, where it occurred in the page. This doesn't happen with a computer because every computer page is different. And one of the reasons books were so fabulously successful I mean fabulously successful between 1455 and 1500. 18 million books were printed. This was not sort of a small invention that slowly percolated through Europe. This exploded in Europe. And the reason was that for the first time, people could read an Aldine edition of Herodotus of 1505, and they could say, you know, on page 185, line 17, I really disagree with what he observed or what he has to say. It made critical thinking as we know it possible because you had a source. You had a written source that was, a, in a way, immutable. You couldn't change it. Every manuscript would be different if Herodotus. You could never say that about a manuscript, but you could say it about a printed book. Secondly, the letter forms were really imbued psychically with those letter forms. I ask people in classes to draw a lowercase g. No one can do it. You have no idea how to draw a lowercase g. But if you see a wrong looking lowercase g, you know it instantly, even though you can't draw it. So even the letter forms in our minds have somehow saturated the point where we recognize good ones from bad ones. And I think thirdly, you know, they're compact, they're affordable, they're done in multiples. We have the great good fortune of having them printed in English, which is the lingua franca today. Thank God I was born, you know, in a, speaking English. If, th if I were French or Italian, this kind of publishing would probably not be possible. It's because we had an English speaking market. And we have copyright. Not that I knew very much about it when I began, but. <laughs> I learned fast. The first, you did <laughs> yeah. learn. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. One more, any question in the audience that you would like to ask? And then Ellen. Ellen. 
we did not move on. Yeah, yeah, American Boys Handy Book, the ugliest book we have ever published. First printed, I think, in 1890, no, before that, 1883. Bill Goodman came to me with the idea that we should reprint this book, which was really addressed to the Boy Scout movement. And it was a book about, you know, what do you do with a kid who says, I'm bored, which was probably prevalent in 1883. And it's full of activities. It's full of, you can make a kite, you can build a canoe, you can make a raft, you can make a violin, you can make a blowgun. It's easy. Kid boys love this book. You know, we're in our now in our 50th printing of that book. We have sold over 600,000 copies of the ugliest book this company has ever done. And nobody gives a damn. So there's an answer. There's a bad answer to a good question. Yeah, we never know. You know what Thurber once said? Sex is a lot like publishing. You never know what's going to happen under the covers. <laughs> and on that daring note... Uh, <laughs> it's better than Mortuary Dolce and Vivos. David, this has been absolutely amazing. If there's ever a titan of a smaller press, you are that person and a history. A small present for you from your friend and mine, Tony King. This is a book we published uh, with Tidepool Press, but I thought you would like it. He also is an AS member. Thank you so much. He's so generous. Anyway, congratulations, that's great.